Hi, my name is Larry, Larry Trannell with Iowa State University Extension. I'm a dairy field specialist in both Northeast and Southeast Iowa. In today's program, we're going to talk about managing dairy farm finances, what I call Dairy Economics 101. When we take a look at dairy farm finances, I think it's important for us to realize that everybody thinks about it different. So I can ask two different people what they think about profitability in their farm or just basically and try to give me an answer. How do you define profitability? And I'm going to get two different answers. So the economics on dairy farms, it's not just how you, um, it's not just the finances part of it. It's how do you satisfy your needs and wants. It's not just financial, but quality of life often has about 50% of the um, decision making into that. You know, what's better for my family? Um, can it save me some time so I don't have to work so hard? Other types of things play into it. We also realize when we're looking at dairy farm finances is that every farm is different in its labor, feed, land, and facility resources. So here we have an example on an Amish dairy farm about uh, having this generator that pulls the TMR mixer, but it's actually drawn by horses in a stall barn. So every farm you know, tends to be different. And as we take a look at it, we need to realize those differences. So what makes pasture dairies or any dairies for that matter profitable? So there's two types of things that I wanna kind of work with here. So our grazing and our organic dairy farmers, they tend to have this minimalist thinking, a lot of them. Okay, what's the least I can do to get by, which means um, buy fewer inputs for my cows. They might produce a little bit of milk, but how much milk can I actually get with buying so few inputs? On the other side tends to be our conventional farmers who can constantly think are we leaving less money on the table by um, not buying this extra input. Okay, so there are two different ways to take a look at it. And quite often we tend to be penny wise but pound foolish. Uh, if you've heard that uh, saying, you know, trying to reduce feed costs or something like that, but it actually really uh, cuts into our milk production. So we realize also that when we take a look at these four guys here and these cows behind them or the cows behind here, that every cow is worth anywhere from 25,000, some studies up to $35,000 worth of economic development potential in a community every year. So they're economic development engines. And that's probably one of the first things we take a look at about managing dairy farm finances is that we're dealing with big businesses, not just for the dairy farmer, but for the community itself. So my objectives to basically take a look at today are how do we best determine profit on a dairy farm and realize that what I tend to find is that labor efficiency is key, which also is part of the reason where we spend most of our labor sometimes is that milking system. And so I tend to find that that milking system is pretty key to our profitability, which will be the source of our second uh, session. How do you analyze organic and other dairy farms and introduce some millionaire model farms, which are some farms that I've been working with for quite a few years? And how do we try to benchmark our comparisons on milk production, feed costs, labor efficiencies, and what I call these top line profits? So these top line profits are the top 10 uh, things that I take a look at on these dairy farms that I can just look at real quick are these uh, green, which means they're good, yellow, which means they're mediocre, or red, which means they could use some improvement. So the top three are the ones with the stars on it, of course, the return on assets. So just like you invest money into a CD in a bank or maybe into the stock market, you expect some kind of a return. Okay, your return on assets is kind of that return that farmers get uh, by investing so much money into land capital, their cows, their machinery, and things like that. So how do you find that return on assets? It's the profit equation, operating profit margin times asset turnover ratio, which we'll talk about in a little bit. The second thing about farmers is that when you take a look at if you're working outside the farm, you may want to think about, you know, what do you get paid per hour? Okay, so I want to try to help farmers think the same thing. So if I'm going to be making $15 an hour, you know, working outside the farm, can I make, in number four here, can I make $20.32 by working on the farm? Okay, so and it's not just the owner operator, which is depicted by number four, but what's all the labor making? So sometimes we have operators that are making less than what um, the average of, of the, uh, all the labor that's in the farm, which means that their employees are making more money than they are. The third one is the, which is the star is number six, is our net cost per hundred weight equivalent. What's it cost you to produce a hundred weight of milk? I think it's important for us to try to get dairy producers to that part. So when we take a look at trying to benchmark I take a look at their labor rankings, which is a 10 here. Their cow ranking is how efficient they are on different cow type um, ratios and things like that. Their per acre ranking, which is kind of mediocre in this one, and their capital ranking. So it's basically their efficiency based on that capital, which kind of relates to the return on assets that we have 
which is a pretty good one in this operation as well. So when we take a look at a dairy farm, so in the top right hand, this is actually a grazing dairy farm. So I can actually uh, try to analyze these as conventional farms, organic farms. Um, and I can actually do organic farms in the West Coast, the East Coast, and the Midwest. There's a lot of different ways that I can actually get these benchmarks. But basically the last column is kind of a benchmark. The, um, the blue column is kind of what this farmer's numbers are in absolute value. And when we take a look at the blue versus per hundred weight equivalent, which is the next one in yellow, and I, we're trying to do some things on energy corrected milk because that plays into profitability as well. And we can benchmark theirs on a per cow basis or a per hundred weight of milk as well. So the bottom line is that when we take a look at farmers' incomes, they have all these different kinds of incomes and they get down to this net cash income. And one of the biggest things that I'll say about net cash income is that it really doesn't mean anything in, in regards to profitability. Okay, it's kind of like the score of the first quarter of a basketball game, and you're trying to figure out if this uh, guy's gonna win or not, or this gal's gonna win or not, or this team's gonna win or not. Okay, so it might give us a semblance who might win, but it sure doesn't give us all of it. So then we uh, change this for inventory, and the bottom line with inventory changes is that, you know, in some years you might have uh, more cows that um, are there at the end of the year that weren't there at the beginning of the year because cows tend to reproduce. You may have more bales of hay, you might have more bushels of corn, different types of feedstuffs that you produce during that year that's actually increased your inventory compared to a year before. So as that all takes place, it's important for us to actually gauge that because even though we don't switch dollars for that, it never gets sold because it's getting fed to a cow maybe. Okay, we, but we still need to track it because that was income during that time frame. So the net farm income here of 112,544. So we take a look at that as being, is it good? Is it bad? The bottom line is I don't know. That's kind of like trying to figure out who won the basketball game at halftime because there's still a lot of things that can actually happen in here. So we haven't charged any interest in, the, in these um, expenses and things like that. Uh, and this is still just on an income side here. So we take a look at taking out the, um, the, the equity and it's at 38,393. So now we have a return to labor after all the expenses of $74,000. So we take a look at that and still say, is it good or not? We don't know if that's one person that earned that money or if it's still three people that might be owner operators that haven't been paid yet that's actually earning that money. So it's kind of like trying to figure it out in the third quarter of the basketball game, did we make money or not? Okay, so that's why it's so important if you're gonna be involved in the dairy business, working with dairy farmers, farming yourself, is that it's so important for us to do a full-fledged financial analysis because until we get down to that bottom line and have all costs included and have it taken over um, either labor units or something like that, then it's hard for us to um, actually ascertain whether or not we made money and how much we made. So the cash income plus the inventory gives you your total income in the top left. Cash costs uh, plus or minus the inventory uh, plus any overhead costs, which are the opportunity costs of both labor, the unpaid labor and also the capital to um, things that haven't been paid yet. And then we have come up with a total cost. And so in this farm, we had a net profit of 34,000. Again, is that good or is it not good? We don't know if that's one person. We don't know if it's two people. We don't know if it's a half a person that actually um, made that money. So, but the important thing too, is that when we take a look at it on a per hundred weight equivalent basis, that you earn 91 cents in this example here. And so when we take a look at earning 91 cents, we know that after all costs were included, including the owner's operator's labor and all their equity and their assets is that they still had a profit of 91 cents per hundred weight equivalent. So I suspect this farmer made some decent money. So we, when we take a look at uh, different ways to take a look at it um, on the income side here at 1850 is what they received for their milk. That was their uh, milk check. Uh, their expenses were 1759. That's how we came up with 91 cents a hundred way. Some people don't like us taking out that equity charge. So if we don't take out that equity charge, which kind of like, if, for example, a 4% uh, charge across all the assets because we didn't charge any interest. Okay, so that actually comes up to uh, quite a bit, almost a dollar, um, actually a dollar or two, a hundred weight, uh, just for that equity charge. So it is a pretty substantial thing, but some farmers don't like to think that way. 
So we also can take out the unpaid labor and the equity, which gets our cost down to 1551. So a net of almost $3 a hundred weight, or we can just take out the labor for a net of $1.97. So bottom line is that there's a lot of different ways that we can take a look at the profitability on a farm. So this is actually um, a part of a Dairy Trans uh, profit performance rating. It's a program I've used since 1993. It's been updated here uh, recently. And so basically what we take a look at how efficient do farmers use their labor? So the FTE is a full-time equivalent of about 3,000 hours. How well do they use your labor? How well are they on a per cow basis and a per crop acre basis? And if you remember on one of those first slides, I had these cow rankings, I had these labor rankings, and I had these acre rankings. Okay, they weren't so high on the per acre ranking, but they were pretty good on these other ones. And so this is kind of where we're going after here. So when we take a look at some of the ones that are looking at here, so we wanna take a look at the 100 weights of milk sold per FTE. Okay, some might wanna do that on an energy corrected milk basis. And so bottom line is that when we have a goal here, so this is the farmer's absolute number. This is a goal of where I think they should be at. This is kind of what I suspect is an average based on some data that I have. And so this is how far they are between the goal and the average. And so you can actually see that this one at 195% is well beyond, well beyond the goal, not just well beyond the average. So cost per or hundred weights sold per FTE laborer. When we start taking a look at that, producers can actually sell out 1.76 million pounds of milk per FTE worker for every 3,000 um, um, hours that get put in the operation during the year. That is a darn good operation. Okay, so a very efficient on the labor side of things. Labor cost per cow at 4.43, which also plays into the labor being so efficient as well. Pounds of milk sold per cow, which is above the goal. And so when we take a look at the pounds of milk sold per cow with the 20,218, uh, some of the other things you might wanna take a look at this capital invested or capital cost per cow. So this is actually a very uh, labor efficient operation as well. And when we take a look at um, say the pounds of milk produced per crop acre. So they're really pounding out milk on a per acre basis. And so some farmers might own three or four or five acres per cow. You've got other farmers that only own say one or 1.125 acres per cow. So we take a look at how much milk they're producing because land isn't getting any cheaper. And so how do we try to intensify our resource use by uh, taking a look at ratios such as that. So when we get down to the, what I call the sweet 16 plus of financial ratios. Okay, the first ones that I'm gonna definitely take a look at, and these were in those top um, line profits is that rate of return on assets of 5.75%. Sure, I'd like to see them be at, um, you know, somewhere around 10%. Um, but you know, 5% is um, okay, but they're only 15% of the way between the goal and the average uh, being at that 15% right there. So the other two that we take a look at are this operating profit margin. So there's different ways and I'll show you this, this um, um, equation in a little bit, bit, but how can you change your operating profit margin? You can either increase your price or decrease your cost. That's going to change your operating profit margin. Okay, so we put that in parentheses. Or we can change your asset turnover ratio. So uh, the, the thing about asset turnover ratios, is kind of like, you know, how, how, much, how many years does it take to gross enough income to pay for all the assets on the farm? Okay, so that asset turnover ratio gets pretty darn important and is actually usually kind of a, a strength of conventional farms where the operating profit margin tends to be a strength of the grazing and the organic farms. But the bottom line is if you multiply your operating profit margin at 10.42% by your asset turnover ratio at 55.12%, you will actually get a 5.75%, which is your rate of return on assets. And so that's one thing I always want people to remember is that profit equation. But again, we'll go through that in a little bit as well. So we've got some other different types of ratios on this line here. Um, but I think the bottom line from this slide is actually going to be go all the way down here to the bottom line is that this is your profit equation. So profit, I want you to equate with return on assets. Your operating profit margin, I want you to think of price minus cost in parentheses. And your volume, your asset turnover ratio, um, I want you to just kind of think about that as how many years does it take to gross enough income to pay for all the assets on the farm. Again, multiply the operating profit margin by your asset turnover ratio and you will get your return on assets, which basically is your profit equation.
So bottom line on this farm is this dairy trans profit status is great at 85%. So taking a look at a lot of different things to work with that one. So again, all those go into these top line profits. So now as I take a look at the return on assets as being the major one, you realize that operating profit margin and asset turnover ratio play into that one. Let me take a look at the unpaid uh, return per hour, that $20.32. We realize that um, that's something we compare to the labor market. The return on assets is something we can compare to the financial markets. Okay, and number six is the net um, uh, cost per hundred weight equivalent. Different ways to look at that as well, but if, with all costs included, we're still making 91 cents a hundred weight. And then just as a review, that labor ranking, so you know where I got some of those numbers at, the cow ranking, the acre ranking, and also that capital ranking are pretty darn good, um, important pieces to actually put into the picture. So by looking at these 10 things, I can look at this farm before I even go through the analysis and I can pick out their strengths and weaknesses and get a pretty darn good feel of um, where this farm needs to work on things. So now here's the focus on profits. Okay, so most people try it as kind of a psychological thing. Instead of focus on, focusing on profits, most farms like to focus on avoiding costs. Okay, so it's one of the things I, have to, I work with a lot of producers on, especially our minimalist thinking, which tends to be our grazers and our organic people, is that they so focus on avoiding costs, sometimes at all costs, is that they, they forego a lot of profits as well. So again, if you're going to remember one thing, it's going to be this thing right here. That profit equals price minus cost in parentheses times volume. So basically profit is return on assets. Price minus cost is your OPM or operating profit margin. And the volume is your asset turnover ratio. Okay, so when people are golfing, what do you focus on? Hitting the ball on the green or focus on not hitting the ball in the pond? And sadly, a lot of people would focus on not hitting that ball in the pond because you don't want to lose your ball. Okay, and where does it tend to go? Okay, it becomes our focus. So again, our focus should be on profitability, not avoiding costs. So this is a summary slide of how do you properly analyze them. So again, I think the rate of return on assets is the best one measure we can actually work with on profitability because it marries the net worth statement. Okay, so the assets minus liabilities, which we'll go through, and also your night farm income statement, which is your incomes and expenses um, of the farm. So the second one is milk production cost per hundredweight, and the third one is return to unpaid labor per hour. Okay, and we take the equity charge, so it's a full cost of production. The only thing left is that labor uh, return. So if I take a look at analyzing a farm with all three of these measures, sometimes I might try to have a, a group of five farms and trying to figure out which one's the most profitable. But I've got one that's highest on rate of return on assets, another one that might have the best milk production cost, and I might have a third one that might get the highest return per unpaid labor hour. So how do you pick and choose those? So I think it's in combination of all three of them together are kind of, I think, what my best bet is to try to figure out which farms are more profitable than other farms. So here's some examples of some organic herds. Okay, so one of the things when you take a look at these um, average organic herds here on the top left, and these are the higher profit ones here, realize that the lower profit organic herds actually earned more money per hundredweight for a milk price. A lot of times producers will be um, complaining about their milk price, okay? But the higher milk price doesn't always necess necessitate a higher profitability. And sometimes it actually works opposite, okay? So what I tend to find is that farmers tend to spend to their milk price, okay? The more they make, the more they tend to spend as well, okay? So that always kind of works here. We also have some grass farms in this group here that gained 3636 uh, in 2018 for a milk price per hundredweight. Um, the uh, lower profit ones had 3508. So the bottom line on a lot of farms is we talk about herd size, we talk about milk production per cow, and I've seen it all over the board about how these can actually operate in different situations. So the bottom line with any farm is what it says on the bottom is how do you best match your land, labor, and facility resources and the feed market that you're uh, playing with there to try to generate profitability on the farm. And again, there's a lot of different ways we can do that. So these are organic model farms from uh, back in 19, or 2018. So we've got some higher profit ones um, 
and then yeah, we've got the average of the higher profit ones, so both grass and organic. And the bottom line here is when we take a look at returns per hour for their labor, is that um, grass farms can be profitable, organic farms can be profitable, conventional farms I've seen at some pretty good levels as well, and grazing farms that are not organic can actually do quite well. So in any given year, um, it's always my guess is who's going to end up most profitable because not one system I don't think is more profitable than others year in and year out. Okay, so when we take a look at it, the bottom line is that we do have producers that are still making some pretty decent money per hour, still getting a pretty good rate of return on assets, and that's even as land prices continue to escalate. Okay, so there's still opportunity within dairy, I think, for a lot of uh, people. So these are some uh, um, both across the USA in the Northwest, which is in California, Idaho, Oregon, and Washington. Here's some farms in Iowa, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. And here's some farms in Maine and Vermont. Okay, so each uh, group might not have a lot of farms into it, but we get a different feel of trying to compare different regions of the country. Okay, so a lot of numbers that actually go into working with it. And one of the things I'll see is that when you take a look at milk sales, on a per cow basis of what it is on average in the USA versus what it might be out west. Okay, so when we see lower milk sales, you might want to think of oh, what breed are they working with. And so if you see the virtual background uh, behind me, they might be working with crossbreds, they might be working with jerseys. So we can't just do everything on a per cow basis. And that's why that energy corrected milk or that milk production per hundred weight equivalent becomes more important because I think a lot of times that's probably a more fair way to actually cross compare uh, these uh, farms that we might be trying to work with. In this slide, I know it's a busy slide, but the only thing I want to pick, pick out is this feed purchased right here. So in 1968 versus 627 versus 2052 versus 1500 over here. So a lot of times people are, when they're taking a look at the profitability of dairy operations, they're really going on, you know, what's your feed purchase per cow? Okay, personally, I really don't care. Okay, the reason why is because the people that brag about having the lowest feed purchased per cow often tend to have the highest feed purchased per hundred weight equivalent or total feed costs and things like that, okay? So even though it's low per cow, milk production per cow might be a lot lower as well. And so they might have the highest uh, feed cost per hundred weight equivalent, okay? So that's a pretty important piece um, of the whole picture. When we take a look at different farms when we take a look at um, unpaid labor hours so here the average in the USA is about 31 which is actually pretty good and these are all organic dairy farms but labor out in the northwest California Idaho Oregon and Washington 17 hours of unpaid labor per cow so you take a look at the system that's sitting behind me in a grazing system and they can do that um, almost year round if not year round to uh, work with it in different parts of the country and so they can really get their labor costs down versus Iowa, Minnesota, and Wisconsin, where that labor is uh, 39 hours per cow, and in Maine and Vermont is at 87. Now in Maine and Vermont, I would tend to say there are so many labor inefficient facilities that they're working with, and just the way they do business is that there's a lot of opportunity in the Northeast um, to work with labor efficiency and get those unpaid labor hours per person down. So bottom line with these organics, in 2018, their earnings were a negative 41 um, cents per hour. The West basically had $1.34 per hour. The Midwest had negative $73.71 and Maine and Vermont actually had a positive $3.78. So they get paid different across the country as they're organic um, in different localities and so there's a lot of things that happen in milk price based on geography, milk price based on somatic cell count, milk price based on components, that really play a big picture into the profitability of these dairy farms as well. So when we take a look at uh, some more data from these organic farms, and I'm just using these organic farms as an example, they could be any type of farm here, pounds of milk sold per cow. Okay, when we take a look at pounds of milk sold per cow, the highest milk production per cow does not always necessitate that they're gonna be the highest profitability either. Okay, I've already had some data sets that actually show an inverse relationship with it, but they typically follows the more milk production, the more profitability. One that I would say tends to um, have quite a bit is this hundred weights of milk sold per cow. So when we take a look at um, how much hundred weights, so you know, we've got six 
622,000 pounds per FTE, old time equivalent here. And you can see they actually get quite low by the time you get out to Maine and Vermont on the far side. Okay, but remember that first uh, example that I showed where they had 1.7 million pounds of milk per person per FTE. Okay, so these things really play into that profitability. And I would basically say that there's a lot of efficiencies that organic dairies might want to uh, take a look at. But the issue with the organic dairies is that a lot of times they're producing their own feed because it's so expensive to buy in the market. So in addition to milking cows, they might be running three, three and a half, sometimes four and five acres per cow to produce all the feed versus a conventional farm that might be buying in a lot of those feeds. And when they buy in a lot of those feeds, they're buying in a lot of labor with it as well. And so their labor efficiencies might be a lot higher. So again, a lot of things to really think about uh, with these herds. Capital invested per cow. <clears throat> As we take a look at the average in the Midwest, and this is one thing that I tend to find, is that here in the Midwest, we take a look at this 22,857. Okay, they have a lot of land, sometimes, like I said, three to five acres per cow. They might have to be heavily invested in facilities. In the Midwest, we tend to have to have a lot of more facilities than they might have here in the Northwest or sometimes even in the Northeast. So there's a lot of things that we can work with and just need to understand in managing dairy farm finances uh, with that as well. When we take a look at, again, the profit equation, return on assets equals operating profit margin and asset turnover ratio. So these farms actually still had a pretty decent asset turnover ratio, but the problem in 2018 was the operating profit margin. Might have been a lower milk price or just some high input costs that have caused that. But because of that, that's why they had so the, the, the lower rate of returns on assets on those farms. This graphic shows cost relative to a $27, $27 pay price. So again, this is an organic example. So if I'm a dairy farmer, I wanna be where the stars are. And this is from 2014 to 2017 data that I personally collected across the country. So when I take a look at who's got the lowest cost of production, so even though they're getting $27, 100 weight for their milk, just on average, or in this example anyway, we had some producers that were producing it for less than $20 a hundred weight. Okay, so I wanna be this person year in and year out that has a lower cost of production relative to whatever pay price I'm getting based on components and um, quality and um, things like that. So when we take a look at, um, this is kind of a, a graph that just shows total labor per hundred weight equivalent, so the total labor cost, okay. And so one of the things that we tend to say is that there's a pretty heavy correlation here between their cost of production and their total labor cost per hundred weight. And I think they group this out at about a two to one ratio. So it's actually a pretty strong ratio. That labor efficiency, again, is where I come back and say we need to spend a lot of time. And again, because of that, it's the milking system, which is why we'll spend some time with that in um, the second um, session, which, which we do. So compare that to feed purchase per hundred weight equivalent, which everybody wants to talk about, didn't have near the correlation that the total cost per hundred weight equivalent um, tended to have. So when we benchmark these labor efficiencies, and I realize these are a lot of numbers. So in this slide, we have conventional farms, we have hybrid grazing farms, we have organic farms, and organic no grain farms, which are basically our grass milk type farms. So let's take a look at just some data uh, from these. Okay, so when you take a look at um, um, the data from, uh, this is another set here from 2016 of Anchor Farms. So we also talk a little bit about not just the systems between organic and grass milk and grazing and conventional farms. We also have larger farms versus smaller farms. And so when we take a look at, um, everybody has this kind of uh, concept. Yeah, there are some economies of scale and dairy. Okay, but I don't believe based on my data that it's get big or get out. And I think there's still a lot of room for small, mediocre sized uh, dairies. We just have to play our cards a little different and make sure we're taking a look at different types of technologies and pay prices for maybe organic or whatever that we can still try to make some money on. So the larger farms, even though they made more money per hour for the um, owner operator here, I can find my cursor at 37.58 versus the smaller farms at 31.85. If I would actually take a look at the labor earnings for all the labor down on the bottom, so the average herd um, was 2331 for the average herd, 2265 for all the labor, not just owner operator, and actually 2485 for the smaller herds. 
So the smaller herds actually earned more for their labor, $2.20 per hundredweight equivalent more than did the larger farms. Okay, so smaller farms can be very efficient. Okay, we definitely got to get to ourselves to a size that's somewhat efficient, but we can definitely work with that. But if I take a look at all these um, opportunities here with number of cows per FTE labor, 100 weights of milk sold per FTE labor, labor costs per cow, and all labor as a percent of total cost, okay, the um, smaller farms are actually very, very competitive. Okay, and actually I think they win, they actually do, um, they actually win all these labor efficiency categories over the larger farms. Okay, so I'm probably one of the last people you want to tell get bigger, get out, because I think these small farms and medi mediocre sized farms can still do uh, quite a bit of, um, be very economically competitive. So now when we take a look at um, ISU Extension has some dairy budgets, and I'm not gonna take the time to go to the, um, the website, but this is the website here where we have some budgets. And so for anybody that's thinking about getting into dairy, um, there's a lot of different ways. So we have nine different organic budgets that we actually take a look at. And when we take a look at different ways to um, produce it just organically, we come up with nine, but I could come up with probably 25 different ways that we could actually try to work with organic dairy operations. Okay, and grass milk is actually part of that as well. There's also eight pasture and conventional budgets. And when I was putting these budgets together, we could take a look at there being probably 25 to 30 different ways to uh, actually produce milk on an organic herd as well. And so when we take a look at the differences of these different types of budgets and the different types of systems, that we have on our farms, I think it's pretty important for us to realize just the variety and the breadth of farms. And so in my extension career over that past over 32 years, I spent 10 years in the Wisconsin extension system, uh, 22 years, I think I'm in Iowa here now. When we take a look at all those different things, probably it was on maybe 15 to 1600 different farms uh, during that time frame, I have yet to meet two farms that actually looked alike or they actually worked them alike, or the managers actually thought that much alike. Okay, so there's a lot of variety that we take a look at with some of these farms that we take work with. So one of the biggest things we take a look at as we um, manage dairy farm finances is people talk about profitability. Okay, but you know, so that's one of the goals that we have is how do you cover all your costs and try to accumulate wealth? So as a younger producer, I think that's a pretty important piece of it. Solvency, you might hear that term, which is how do you avoid losses and lose wealth reduction over time and try to avoid losing that wealth. Okay, so as you get older than 45 years old, you start thinking more security. Where younger than 45, you're probably thinking a little bit more about risk. Okay, so I think it's important, you know, just the time frame as you're working with farmers or become a farmer yourself, that um, what are you working with? Profitability, solvency, and then we take a look at liquidity. Okay, this is basically cash flow. And so many producers and bankers and other people, they confuse cash flow with profitability. Yes, there may be a positive correlation, but the farms that tend to be the most profitable long-term are the ones that have highest rates of return on assets long-term, not highest levels of cash flow. And then we also have, like I said, our, our psychological income um, and quality of life, what we wanna do. So sometimes I used to say, it's kind of our older farmers that wanted to work with more quality of life but because of generational changes and things like that, now I tend to say it's our younger generation that's worried more about quality of life on the farm than the older generation probably did. But again, bottom line is that this is the profit equation that I think is the important thing to get into our minds to remember that return on assets equals the operating profit margin times the asset turnover ratio. Okay, so we've got this operation um, back in the early 1990s. I started this thing called Dairy Farm Millionaires. So my goal was how can I help young people become millionaires in the dairy industry over a 25 year period. So we put together different types of budgets um, of what they would have to come where in the back then, if you could come up with $30,000, uh, get a return on assets of close to 10%, uh, using 80 cows on 80 acres and only have about 15 to $20,000 worth of machinery to begin with, but realize year two and year three, that's gonna probably increase uh, dramatically. It was kind of in a system where you're gonna be um, trying to run these 80 acres by renting it and running the 80 cows and then buying the rest of the feed. So it's what I call a rent by feed system um, and buying a lot of corn silage in there as well. And so basically with a lot of farmers numbers, 
I could um, figure out that we could help these farmers become millionaires. And I did that with quite a few uh, people. So I realized that in the early 2000s, I started doing this with organic herds as well, as well and um, not just grazing ones. Um, so this growth over the time, time frame here. So I've had farmers that within 14, 15 years that have actually become millionaires. Okay, just uh, from what they, where they started to where they got. Okay, so 19, 20 years is definitely not uh, farm fetch, but they would have done more by milking more cows or uh, buying land and maybe getting some um, asset growth on the land and things like that to be able to try to uh, graze or grow that profitability. Okay, so as we manage dairy farm finances, it's important for us to acknowledge our weaknesses, focus on our strengths, and how the whole goal, I think, is how do you take data? Because every farm's got data. It's not just milk production data. You've got financial data. And turn that data into information, which I try to do with my Dairy Trans program, and that information into knowledge, which we do with benchmarking and trying to cross-compare our farm to other farms. And how do you do all that stuff to make informed decisions? Okay, so the important part is that every dairy farmer has this, these tax records. Okay, so we need to adjust these cash records, which we tend to get off our taxes with accrual inventory. So those beginning and ending inventories to analyze the business. And without doing that, it's very difficult to try to analyze the business. So I say that we need to know your cost of production and your relative per person, per acre and per cow efficiencies to really get a good feel for how important um, or how uh, in depth we can actually analyze this dairy farm. So let's go through a couple examples. Here's net farm income from operations, cash income minus cash expenses equal net cash farm income per cow. And I already told you, this is like the end of the first quarter of a basketball game. It doesn't tell me much of anything, just like your schedule F doesn't tell me much of anything if you even had the semblance of making profits that year. So we adjusted for inventory. So we have some prepaid expenses. We might prepay from one year to the next. We need to adjust that out. We have bills, accounts payable that we didn't pay in the year that we should have and we left them as go for the next year. We need to adjust that. We have feed inventory that we may have gained or lost during that current year. Livestock that might have um, either grown in number or decreased in number that we need to appreciate. And the big one often tends to be depreciation. So that gives us an NFIFO, which is our net farm income from operations. And the goal for that is our opportunity cost of labor and capital. The stuff that we don't tend to pay ourselves for is our own labor as the owner manager and the, as the assets that are being used out there that we need to get a return for. So when you look at managing dairy farm finances, these are the big three financial statements. You have a net worth statement. So you have a snapshot, pretend you're taking a picture. So it's a before and after. So every January 1st, you go out to your farm and you take a picture. And in that picture shows the number of cows the number of bales of hay, the tons of corn silage, the bushels of corn, okay? The number of heifers, okay? So everything that is listed there is in that picture. And you do that same thing at the end of the year on December 31st. And then you compare these two pictures, ending minus beginning, to give yourself a good feel of what that inventory adjustment actually is. Okay, so the net worth statement, it actually has all your assets listed, all your liabilities listed, and the bottom line, if you subtract those out, you get your net worth. And your net worth is what you are worth. Is it $400,000? Is it $2.4 million? Okay, but that's the distance between you and insolvency or bankruptcy. So the second one is the net farm income statement. So now we're starting, instead of taking these still pictures, we're gonna take a video off the farm. So we're gonna be going out there from January 1st all the way through the end of the year and every day, uh, we have this video pretty much because it, it, our checkbook kind of tabulates it. Every time we write out a check or use our credit card, okay, or get a milk check in that we deposit, is that this stuff is being recorded continually throughout the year, okay? And this is our cash incomes, our cash expenses, and we're going to adjust it for inventory, of course, based on our net worth statement, but this is going to give us a net farm income statement, okay? The third one, and this is the one your banker likes, is your cash flow statement. So it's all sources and uses of cash, both farm and on farm. Okay, so I have a little byline that lenders put more stock in cash flow ability than your profitability. Okay, so if a spouse works off the farm and you're guaranteed $45,000 a year coming onto the farm, that means more to them probably than they have taken the risk of your own profitability on the farm. Okay, so again, cash flow is all sources and uses of cash, not just stuff on the farm. Your net farm income statement and your net worth statement 
should just be for the farm. So the data, the data, the net worth statement, I think is crucial and it needs to coincide with your tax accounting period. So if you file your taxes from January 1st to December 31st, and that's your accounting year, what happens if your net worth statement is done on January 15th? Okay, and I'm gonna say lots of things because cows could die. You just ate up 15 days worth of feed. And maybe the, the year before you didn't do it until um, the, you know, January 30th or whatever. Okay, so there are a lot of things that can change. So it's gotta be a, according to your tax year. So if it's January 1st, it's January 1st is when that net worth statement also can kind of skew the accuracy of it. When we take a look at uh, the um, net worth statement, so on the left side are the farm assets and the right side are the liabilities. So it's what you own versus what you owe. And it basically gives you um, assets minus, minus liabilities equal net worth. So net worth in this case is 281,000. So when you take a look at on the right side here, this total liabilities, you have a 57% debt to asset ratio. So we take those debts at 366,850 and we'll divide that by the 648,500. Okay, that'll give us a debt to asset ratio. So that gives me a good feel at 57%. This is kind of a heavily indebted farm. Okay, so if it's only 33%, I don't worry about it. When it starts creeping up to 60%, I start worrying about it a little bit more. Okay, so solvency measures. Um, I think the only thing I want to mention here is that, you know, people think about principal payments as an expense, and it really isn't. So the interest on your principal payments, so if you have to pay back a loan, you got to pay back both principal and the interest. Okay, so the interest is an expense to the farm business, but the principal payment is not. It's an investment that you choose or your banker makes you make into as an investment uh, back into your farm business, okay? So in no way, shape or form should we think of that principal payment as an expense of the business. And the only place you'll see that principal payment is on the cash flow statement. It will not be part of profitability net farm income statement. So the banker needs their money back with interest. So solvency is important as liquidity in the long run. Okay, so if we run into problems sometimes, can we delay principal, do this, that, or the other thing? But again, bankers will spend a lot of their um, time working on assets and working on cash flow because if the, if the uh, business goes sour, you need to be able to pay it back, which is cash flow, or they need to be able to take assets to pay it back. Okay, so that's why those are important and to them more important than the profitability of the farm. Okay, so when we take a look at solvency measures, I've got a few of them listed here. The one that I spend the most time with is uh, the debt to asset ratio. Again, total farm liabilities divided by total farm assets in the example we have there. When we look at financial efficiencies, how well does the business do business or is the business leaving money on the table is an important part of the piece of the puzzle with that as well. So it's an effectiveness of production, pricing, selling, financing, marketing, different types of things. So we look at this operating profit margin. Okay, so again, the whole goal of this profitability and efficiency is that profit equation. Profit equals price minus cost times volume. I can't speak about that enough. So basically we're gonna take our operating profit margin and you can see the equation here, uh, divided or and multiply that by our asset turnover ratio. Again, how many years does it take to gross enough revenue to pay for all the assets in the farm? And so if we can do that in three years, I think that's a pretty good goal. We've got some farms that can do it in two years. I've got other farms that take some five to six, seven, sometimes eight years to gross enough income to pay for all the assets on the farm. And I can almost guarantee those farms are probably not going to survive very long. So return on assets, that's the equation there. Uh, when people take a look at, um, do you really need to know the equation? You need to know what the, the ratio means, not so much memory of the equation itself, okay? I think that's the important part. So sometimes people ask me off the street, uh, you know, what goes into this equation? I said, I'll have to look because I don't memorize them either. Okay, so what should a producer know? I would tend to say they should know the differences between profit and cash flow. Um, so again, the profitability uh, is that return on assets and those things that kind of went in there, how much we're making for our labor versus cash flow. Can we just get our bills paid? Because sometimes a low debt farm might not have much issue with um, cash flow, but they might be less profitable. Even though they got higher cash flow, they might be less profitable than another farm that might have some higher debt. We need to know those production efficiencies, uh, how to keep the records, to calculate the measures. And then it's important for us to learn how to, to um, interpret these measures as well. 
So here's a cash flow statement. And I think the important part of this cash flow statement is you will see the principal payments on here. This is the only place you'll see the principal payments. Okay, but a lot of these things really don't have much to do with the farm. Beginning cash balance that could come from the farm. It could come from a spouse's off-farm job. Non-farm income. Again, where does that come from? It could come from anywhere. The income tax is paid. It could be because of the farm. It could be because of a spouse's uh, job or some other investments that we might have. Again, principal payments. This is the only place we'll see it. Family living expenses, capital purchases. These will be farm capital purchases. So this is part of the farm. Capital sales in the same respect. The new monies from loans and savings that could come from anywhere. The net farm income, that is a big part of the farm itself. And so bottom line is that there's a lot of things that go into this cash flow that are non-farm related. And that's the big piece to remember along with the thought that principal payments, this is, might be the only place you'll see that. So an ending cash flow at 3.39%. A banker would like to see that um, at least at 10%, um, as you can see right there. And so uh, they're a little bit shy of that uh, to work with that. But that's kind of a cash flow statement. So again, we saw this slide already about how it's best to uh, work with it. Um, the Dairy Trans software is available for uh, Iowa producers and for anybody to take a look at. Um, but basically we're looking at a lot of ratios and you saw some of the, um, the outputs on there. Here's one that I wanna take a look at, maybe even kind of come close to finishing up with, is that when you take a look at grazing farms and conventional farms, grazing farms and organic farms, and we take a look at their cost or production, this is some older data, but the bottom line um, hasn't changed much here, is that we have a conventional farm at $622, $624 of profit or um, of net return per cow, 672 for the grazing farms, 859 for the organic farms. So we look at this and we right away say, well, it looks like the organic farms are more profitable than the rest of them. And I'm saying this is exactly what this graph is not saying. Because when we take a look at these conventional farms, which farms tend to have higher levels of debt and higher levels of paid labor? And both of those things are probably already in the numbers of this conventional farm versus a grazing farm or an organic farm that might have hardly any debt and hasn't paid their assets yet. And it might not even have hardly any um, hired labor and hasn't paid that labor yet. So the labor bill and between the assets is just not that far fetched that we look at this and think organic is that much more profitable, but we could actually put six to $800 of more cost onto that organic that hasn't been on here yet if we use this farm net farm income average. And so that's why I tend to say very strongly is that it's like the halftime or third quarter of a basketball game. Know what numbers you're looking at because you can read the papers all over and you can see people using these numbers and say my farm is more profitable than that farm because of this number. And I say that's not true. There's so many more things that you need to take a look at um, in working with your operation versus some others. So again, there's a lot of different ways we can work with uh, different types of farms. There's a lot of different data that we can work with um, from big farms versus smaller farms. How do we term, determine profit? We realize that the interest charge versus an equity charge of what we own versus what we owe the bank can affect the profitability. Renting versus owning can affect that net farm income measure as well. Paid versus unpaid labor. So those are just a few of the things that I would tend to say um, are working um, that we need to work with and have an understanding as we look at um, trying to work with the profitability of the different types of farms. So like I said, those budgets are online. They probably need to be updated for some current numbers here now. But again, in the managing dairy farm finances, there's so many things we can take a look at in trying to work with it. So um, this is gonna be the last slide. If anybody has any questions, um, if anything that I covered, uh, you can find a lot of resources at the um, top of the screen there, the www.extension.iestate.edu slash dairy team or my personal email is trannel at iastate.edu that you can get a hold of me or just email me with some questions as well since we don't have time for a Q and answer session with this recorded session. So with that, again, Dr. Larry Trannel with ISU Extension Dairy Field Specialist. Uh, thanks for listening and hope you enjoyed the presentation.